So this is um, a statistic that's specific to autoimmune disease, which by the way, is something medicine does know exists. <laughs> It's mm -hmm. pretty, um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of women in particular have autoimmune diseases and they're very real and very debilitating. And there's a wide number of them. And this was a figure that came from the autoimmune association. And they found that in their first years of being sick, 45% of people searching for diagnoses, um, were told they were hypochondriacs. <laughs> Megan O'Rourke, welcome to my way. How are you? I'm okay. Thank I'm glad to be here talking with you. I'm so excited that you're here. I've been wanting to have a chat like this with someone for the whole time I've had this podcast. And so I'm incredibly excited and I just want to jump right in. Loads of people uh, told us about you, told us about your work when I was searching for someone with whom I could discuss chronic illness in depth. And I've touched on this subject before with other episodes, but I haven't had such a similar experience as the one I've had with you and so uh, not just for my audience who've been dying for a conversation about this but also for me personally this means a lot I really oh. appreciate you so mm, just to just to to dive in what made you write the invisible kingdom reimagining chronic illness you know it really was born out of my own experience and I the quick version is that I got mysteriously ill right after I graduated from college and went on this roller coaster of symptoms um, that roamed my body. Some, some of them were small, some of them were significant. I was in a lot of pain. I experienced fatigue. Anyway, went to see doctors on and off for more than a decade and no one could tell me what was wrong. And in fact, many of the people I saw didn't even believe something was wrong. So I would mm. go in saying, you know, I think I, I feel like something's wrong. I feel like my body is working differently from other people's bodies. And it was a lot of just like, oh, do you have a stressful job? Maybe you're anxious, you should get more sleep, that kind of thing. Um, so then my mother died. To make a long story short, I got really, really sick after she died. And kind of it was like falling off a cliff or suddenly going into deep water after walking in shallow water. Mm -hmm. And I realized something was very, very wrong. And I, at that point, became a much more kind of fierce advocate for myself and embarked on this quest to identify what was going on and to really get answers. And that involved looking for better healthcare providers, journeying into integrative medicine, and doing research. And I think at one point along the way, feeling incredibly lonely, I realized that I had to take all of this research and obsessive um, learning I was doing and turning it, turn it into a book that I could share with other people who, like me, probably felt pretty unheard and unseen in similar journeys. Mm -hmm. And so the health issues you described, you would call invisible right some people might not have heard yeah. the terminology invisible illness a lot of us have heard about chronic illness but when we think of someone being incredibly sick we think about them looking sick right they're going to be pale or they're going to have a, a, a walk that doesn't look as though it's easy to do you know it's we, we expect to be able to see it written all over anyone's faces even invisible disabilities exist uh and so so did you look like the picture of health yeah, no, you've just nailed it. So I looked so healthy. I was a big runner. I was very fit. My doctors would be like, your cholesterol is so low. Mm -hmm. And over and over, people would say to me, you look great. How could you be sick? And so that was this added complexity, because I could tell that people really didn't believe I was sick, right? And that added a whole different kind of shadow to the experience of having to insist, you know, something's really wrong and then feeling kind of guilty almost, right? Because yeah. it was like, I looked fine. And in fact, I had a host of my ultimate diagnoses. I had multiple diagnoses of these so-called invisible illnesses, um, including an autoimmune disease, including a genetic condition, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the mm -hmm. hypermobile kind. Which anyway, have. which you, right. And so, as you know, it's like people don't, can't see that you're sick and, um, that is one of the strangest things about the experience is how acutely ill you can be while looking fine. Did it ever make you gaslight yourself? Did you ever percent. question yourself? Yeah. What was yeah. that like? Oh, you know, Jamila, that was almost the hardest part of the experience. And to be honest, I feel I'm still unlearning the gaslighting that I did. So what I would say is in that decade I was describing when I was going to doctors, I really accepted the narrative that 
maybe I was just a little neurotic or a little bit anxious, even as some part of me, it's hard to explain because it was, it's a bit paradoxical. Some part of me knew, but then another part of me, the acculturated part of me, the part of me that was a young woman taught to listen to experts, um, right. really started to believe that, that maybe I, I thought, God, you know, I must just be like, bad at living. You know, yeah, like I just never figured out the whole adulthood fussy, the princess and the pea, my mother used to call me. Um, and, and so it was my mom too, and my dad who were very loving parents, but also, by the way, this is something that happens to many people is your own family kind of participates in the gaslighting um, mm -hmm. a little bit unintentionally because most people just don't understand, I think, the nature of these illnesses. Yeah. yeah. And psychosomatic symptoms do exist. They are mm -hmm. real. You know what I mean? Just like placebo Absolutely. exists. And so we we feel afraid. There's that kind of like, I guess that instinct, especially in parents, you know, when a kid falls over to be like, oh, I don't want them to be traumatized by them falling over. So it's like, get up, get up, get up, get up. Come on, you're fine, you're fine, you're totally. fine, you're fine. Look over there. And so I think that that lives on in parents for quite a long time of just like positive thinking, you know? Absolutely. I think you can neuroticize about your health and that can stress you out and that can make symptoms worse. But at the same time, I don't think there's anything more stressful than being denied uh, a diagnosis because being denied a diagnosis means being denied care. It means being denied the, the hope of treatment and the hope of another lifestyle. And something you said in your book, you know, and that you've said generally is that, you know, you were in your 30s, I think it was, when you realized that everyone else hasn't been walking around in pain and feeling like shit their whole lives. Totally. And I really resonated with that. I was younger, like I was I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And would you explain what Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is? Sure, absolutely. So it's, a, it's actually a host of different interconnected genetic conditions that affect mm -hmm. what's known as connective tissue in your body. But connective tissue, which I didn't understand until really I almost finished, had almost finished writing this book affects everything in your body, including the, the walls of your veins. Mm -hmm. um, so in Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, your connective tissue is made differently than it usually is. And it's a little bit more fragile. Um, and so it's a little stretchier. And so your joints, you know, are held together by ligaments that tear more easily, but your veins also don't constrict properly, which can lead to fatigue um, because blood's not getting to your brain, right? So all of these very basic human processes that we rely on in an unconscious way are just more fragile and more susceptible to going wrong in the bodies of people with um, Ehlers Danlos. Yeah, and if you need an operation, you exactly. can bleed more, you can't have a lumbar exactly. puncture, which is where they retrieve information like cellular right. data from your spine, which is sometimes very important in a big emergency. Um, yep. I think uh, pregnancy is incredibly dangerous, childbirth is extremely dangerous, but also uh, you can't have the injection in, what's that called? The, the epidural. epidural. Um, mm -hmm. You can't have an epidural safely. Uh, dentist work is fucking horrendous because your teeth are super hard for some reason. At least, mm -hmm. you know, that was a, a symptom of mine. Um, and you dislocate constantly, especially if you have yeah. the hypermobile type. Uh, and so you'll be walking down the street in heels, having the best time and then one minute later you're having right. to be like carried the rest of the way to the restaurant um you swell i don't know about you but i swell yeah I swell constantly by the end of every day in fact like probably by 11 a.m i start yeah. swelling and then by the yeah. end of the day i'm you sort of like a marshmallow man version of myself <laughs> Um, but I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I was really lucky. I was nine years old. It's never lucky to have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, but no. I was lucky to be diagnosed so young because EDS makes your life so complicated that you have to live in a very safe way for EDS, which means no contact sports. It really means be very careful if you're going to try drinking or taking drugs, which is why I didn't do either. <laughs> yeah. um, it means be very careful about the shoes that you wear be careful totally. about the uh, holidays that you go on be careful about the climate that you choose to live in like you have to pay a lot more attention to that stuff and so i'm really really glad it was professor rodney graham who's sort of one of the like mm. founding fathers of alist danlos syndrome who diagnosed me but even even with that diagnosis there still wasn't a lot of information there's a really only proper information coming out like now so yeah. i spent my 20s also thinking how is everyone going out all the time? How are they taking drugs and then going to work? Totally. The next day? Like, how's everyone having this much sex and not getting constant like fucking kidney problems? Like, how is like how are yeah. they doing this? And I was like, what cheat code? Do I just not have enough drive? Am I lazy? Like, like lazy was a word that was used about me all the time, and I used it about myself. I still do. Um, and I also just am lazy. So let's just be real. Let's just be real. It's not just illness. <laughs> um, but. 
but I um I I always felt like I was some sort of like pathetic weakling for not for, for the fact that everyone must feel this way I didn't know that everyone didn't feel 80 from the time they were 16. You've just, I mean, I'm actually going to get tears in my eyes. I mean, you've just expressed so much of what I felt and still honestly feel Though it gets a bit easier as you get older because mm -hmm. there's less expectation that you have boundless energy. But, you know, that sense that everyone else has more energy and it must be something about you as a person that's wrong, that's flawed, that's lazy. I mean, you know, you said you really are lazy, but I would just say like, as you say, every aspect of our life is more complicated and takes more forethought yeah. and takes just a little bit more willpower and energy and planning. And so, and planning, and that is exhausting. And, mm -hmm. you know, to this day, my husband has no idea how exhausting it is for me just to kind of get through the day. And look, I have an amazing life. I have two little kids. I have a great job. I write books. Like I love my life. I get to do incredible things, but it all takes a toll. And I think the other part that's really hard, Jamila, that you're getting at is that if the nature of these kinds of chronic illnesses and of Ehlers-Danlos in particular is that it manifests a little bit differently in everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's quite easy to look at another person who's getting by and think, well, she's also sick or they're also sick. And why is this harder for me? Why is my knee dislocating all the time? You know, and it's just that we're all a little bit different. And yeah, it's a spectrum. Incredible. It's yeah. a spectrum for sure. Yeah. And there's also like HEDS, which is hypermobile. Right. I think uh, right. Ehlers Danlos syndrome, which is what we both have. Yeah. Um, interestingly, comes with uh, uh, a very youthful appearance. Mm -hmm. Because I did not you, know that. Yeah, <laughs> there's something to do with the lack of collagen or something, and how stretchy we are. That means that we mm -hmm. snap back. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm 37 and I've got no frown lines. Oh, and I'm so, I'm English, <laughs> like right. We frown all of the time. <laughs> I, I should just be a Sharpe at this point, um, but because it snaps back. So again, like that contributes to the fact that I look a lot younger than my mm. peers or I have like mm. smoother skin than my peers. And therefore, again, they're like, well, you look well. I mean, I got publicly accused of having Munchausen uh, oh, in no. 2020 and the yeah. internet just ran with it because I had allergies that didn't make sense. Part of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome also means it is I don't know if concurrent is the word, but you can at the same time get uh, other things, right? It's got yeah. lots of co, is the, is the comorbidity the right term? Yeah, I think comorbidity is exactly the right word. Yeah. So like um, a lot of people with ehlers Sandler's syndrome have uh, POTS, which I know you have. Can you yes. explain what POTS is? Absolutely. So um, POTS is a uh, shorthand for postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which you may, your listeners may have heard because it's in the news a lot after the COVID pandemic. A lot of people with long COVID have some form of POTS as well. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. So a lot of long COVID is very either POTS itself or quite like POTS. So in POTS, your um basically the autonomic nervous system, which is your unconscious nervous system, the part you're not really thinking about that just regulates things like your blood pressure. When you, when you go from sitting to standing, your blood pressure has to change so that you don't faint. Mm -hmm. um, and it needs to push blood to your brain so you can continue thinking and walking and doing all those things. Mm -hmm. In POTS, that just doesn't happen properly. Your no. nervous system fails to do it. So by the way, one of the fun things is you faint all the time and you might get Constantly. a concussion. Yeah, you know? and I get, I get uh, injuries, I'm covered in right. bruises. Like I'm right. always so right. worried that people are gonna think my boyfriend's right. like abusing me right. because I've got totally. so many fucking marks all over myself. And all I don't right. remember how I got most of those bruises, A, because I bruised so easily, but B, because I, um, was normally unconscious when it happened. Like I just constantly pass out. It does, oh. you know, I have found that my POTS, and maybe this is just sensible, but it gets better when I'm doing regular exercise. So when I'm yeah. walking every day, I find that that naturally helps my circulation, but like I'm fucking freezing all the time. Like yep. I can't like warm up quickly. I can't cool down quickly. I don't really sweat. Yep. Like yep. I, uh, I don't like, I take all these supplements and don't really get it around my blood. So my blood tests don't show the amount of supplements I'm taking it's a real son of a bitch of a condition like it's, <laughs> totally it's, is. Um, it's un fucking believable and it's <laughs> and it's also like really nice that we can talk to each other in like a shorthand because yeah. i imagine when you're interviewed by someone who hasn't got this they're like 
what and you can have this as well and this so like another thing that comes with pot sorry with eds is a uh, mast cell right which is sometimes yeah. known as mcas and that that is just basically your body developing i guess histamine reactions to new things constantly it's just going on and off so i'm allergic to something for a while then i'm not allergic then i'm allergic then i'm not allergic uh and so really? my life is like constant russian roulette of like can i and it's it's not just food it's not like the big ones like shellfish peanuts etc it's it was air fresheners for me for three years Ooh. so i couldn't get in an uber because they yeah. got the air fresheners to like you know air out all the the drunks vomit from the night before uh, <laughs> oh and i couldn't get in like a cab for three years and i couldn't uh, wow. i went to like a, a a really fancy dinner party um and i had to ask them to like blow out all of their like six thousand dollar diptyque candles <laughs> I was say the dip <laughs> like you know I, it was a it was it's like and then and then suddenly i'm fine so yeah. that again leads to people being like ah uh, wait i thought you right. couldn't right right and and so it's this constant it's it's constant maths it's just you're doing it constant is. mental arithmetic about what it you is. can and can't do and that makes you feel crazy and given that this is a mental health podcast i'd love to hear the impact of of going through something like that because we're always like for the few people who believe us and understand us they think oh you're so strong my boyfriend just thinks i'm so strong mm -hmm. but like the toll that it takes on having to be so strong. Can you describe that for me, please? Yeah, no, you just, it is funny. Um, I'm, I'll am i say first just that it, it is kind of amazing to hear someone else talk about this, right? Because one of the tolls is that you feel so alone with mm. all of it. You feel like it's you. Even as I read about these things and I researched them and I interviewed other people and I know, okay, mast cell activation syndrome exists, right? There were so many years I was so alone with this and I still feel alone with it. And one can start to feel like it's all you, like you're fussy, you're this. And as you say too, there's this kind of mathematical, you know, there's these constant equations I'm doing. I just went on vacation with my kids and I had to be like, okay, I only want to go to this hotel because I've stayed there before and I didn't have an allergic reaction to it. And there's a food place nearby where I know I can eat, right? It starts to sound very, very princess in the pea and it can feel exhausting and isolating to a experience it and then b have to explain ourselves mm -hmm. because i think one reason i wrote the book is that people just don't understand right we understand if someone has cancer and has chemotherapy we know what that looks like we know they'll be tired we know mm -hmm. the kinds of things they'll go through they don't actually have to explain it to us right i know but a lasagna syndrome would just make such a boring movie do you know it what would I be mean? a terrible movie right it's not love story right it's just <laughs> chronic well that's the only problem these things are chronic right so i think no representation i know right but it's like we both have to undergo something quite challenging and then we also have to find a way to explain it to other people so for me, that's been a very up and down experience. I think, um, I don't know, you know, sometimes I think, okay, I've got this, like I've figured it out. I know how to advocate for myself and I'm mm. confident in my ability to do so. And then all of a sudden that will just all disappear and I'll have a really bad flare and I'll think, what did I do wrong? You know? <laughs> what, oh my God, I same, same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I, um, I have at times, like there was a point where in February this year, I was in so much pain that I became suicidal again. And I haven't been suicidal in years, probably yeah. since I got gaslit and accused of having Munchausen by the world. That made me really suicidal. And I had to that call was it. horrible. It was that really was horrible. horrific. Uh, and it was also like, you know what bums me out about that the most um, is that the stupid sons of bitches who started that rumor didn't realize that like, I can, I might be okay. Like I might, I might have a support system. I've got money for a good therapist, but all the other people out there who were reading that, who go through the same thing, who have the same condition or some other autoimmune disease, like lupus, like a lot of things that you cover in your book, right? All yeah. kinds of different autoimmune diseases. And in a second, I'd love to discuss what an autoimmune disease is, but like so many people struggle with invisible illness and then the chances of them being accused by Munchausen grew yeah, via exactly. my being like dragged by my pubes across the gutter of oh, the internet no. um but the, i felt suicidal again in february because i was just like i just can't i can't and i don't advocate for that and i, I and I, I got through to the other side of it and i feel really good now but i do want to make space for people who feel that like you're not weak if you're like oh god i just want to tap out but you do have to try to carry on because it does lift but there are times where it becomes so overwhelming where you're like oh my god i just like i had some fun 
in like last summer and then I got sick almost immediately afterwards. And so you feel kind of like, do you ever feel like you get punished for like yeah. having a good time or having a normal time? And then you go through periods of feeling better and you're like, I'm cured. Uh, it doesn't matter how many decades you've been alive, <laughs> but you know, you, you get this, like, you're just like this constant, like Disney character-esque optimism that you know totally. you're like i've cracked the nut <laughs> like i'm gonna be fine but you and know then you that, get sick yeah. again and it feels like you've been like caked oh, yeah. off the fucking top of the i don't know empire state building totally you know what that makes me realize though is that you know i think we spend so much time wondering about what kind of people we are but just think about how optimistic we actually are we're actually very optimistic people many of us who are chronically ill because when we get better for a moment we're like life is amazing let's like suck the marrow out of it right? so true so <laughs> true oh my god i like if i feel well i wake up like i woke up this morning and my face wasn't swollen and like i've just been a delight to everyone <laughs> Like just because no, I'm not feeling, because with great. the swelling, with the swelling comes like the feeling of like the yeah. brain fog and the fatigue. Yeah. And I woke up so and I just felt okay. And I got seven hours sleep, which is right. very right. difficult to have with ALS and loss yes. yeah. And, um, and I've just been like, like I, I'm in the best mood ever. And so I wouldn't, I would still rather not have this higher high if I could yeah. not have such low lows, I know. but there is a, there is a real beauty to chronically sick people. I know that's such a grotesque sentence, but I'm gonna explain it, in that we are fucking legends. We are right. legends for getting out of bed every day and for getting, frankly, anything done, like for going outside in weather that is damp or cold, which changes the fucking like, yes. pressure in the atmosphere, which changes our day. I know, which makes everything terrible. I know. Just ridiculous. Uh, we've had like rain in LA for like six months and I've just been so sick because of it. And it's so infuriating that something like drizzle I know. in a relatively warm climate <laughs> compared to most places in winter can just take me out. Um, but we are heroic in our capacity to to carry on and also to maintain that optimism that you and I were sort of joking about a minute ago, because yeah. yeah. it's really fucking testing. And, and then we do it without the social support of anyone really yeah. understanding or believing us. And, yeah. and I, I have a lot of people who, you know, write to me all the time, but how do I explain to my partner? Yeah, I think that's another struggle is like, there's this guilt. I don't know that if you feel it, but I feel this guilt sometimes because I've been with my boyfriend since he was 26. And and I'm like, oh God, like I'm slowing down your life because mm. there's so many things that I can't do or you have to go and do without me and you wish I could come. Like he, he's a mm. DJ and he DJs until four or five in the morning. It's like, yeah. I can't fucking go and do that. Yeah. I'm not yeah. normal. No. <laughs> I can't, I can't participate. I can't go on tour with him and travel and fly every day. Yeah. Like that'll fuck up my body. Like, and so, yeah. so I, I'm, I'm still wrestling with, and I wonder how you deal with that. Cause you have a whole family. Yeah, it's really hard. Shouldn't feel guilty. I'm just we saying sh we, that we, we do. Sh we shouldn't, but I, I first want to just echo, I think I really do. This sounds hokey, but I, I want to, I just so agree with you that I really do feel that the chronically ill people I know are the strongest people I know. And no one has any fucking yeah. clue, sorry, it's any clue of how strong yeah. they are. Oh no, please, we love um, swearing on you this You know, podcast. it's just like, just to get through the day, like the amount of willpower that all of us are using. So I just salute everyone out there who's doing that in various ways. Um, and then, yeah, you know, I think I'm like, it's maybe the mood I'm in right now, but I'm just like, no, the partners have to get with the program. <laughs> they have to yeah. understand where we are. Like, we should not feel guilty. Of course, there are times where I feel incredibly guilty, especially as a mom. Talk about mm. POTS and EDS. By the end of the day, usually I'm wiped. And it's really, that's when my kids have like that weird burst of mitochondrial that puppies, energy that, like, that little zoomies. children get. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they just like suddenly like come alive like gremlins. And I have to be like, nope, can't do it. I have to lie down. Like you can come jump on me, but I can't get up and run around with you. So, you know, my kids at this point kind of know that. Um, and there are times where I feel really, really sad about it, or there'll be times where kids see me in pain and they get really, really worried. But mm. I've been quite transparent with them because I I really want a world where, I don't know, where, where chronic illness is normalized and understood and we don't have to explain it. And so I think, okay, if I can raise them in a way that helps them see that. And then the other thing I would say is my, my um, Older son also, we think, has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. He basically has been diagnosed with it. He hasn't had a dislocation yet, so it's not technically a diagnosis until that happens. But 
he's pretty, he's been in PT for it for two years. Mm. So I think I've also tried to bring, I don't know, try, I try to get rid of the guilt when I can, because I want to teach him. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to get a little emotional, but I, I don't want him to ever feel like less than a whole person Mm -hmm. because he's living with Eller Stanlos. And so Mm -hmm. that has been a huge motivating factor for me. And really looking at my own behaviors and Mm -hmm. what that's teaching him. I'm not great about it, but I'm trying really hard to be like, when I don't feel well, just be like, this is what I'm feeling and this is what I'm going to do. And that happens sometimes and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really, really vital. And I'm really lucky that I have a partner who's always just like, he just thinks I'm so strong and he has his due diligence to like look into it so much and yeah. talk to my, you know, like medical practitioners and, and really understand not just my point of view, but like everyone. So there are certain things where, cause I don't look into the condition very much. Like I'm learning stuff from you. Um, mm. And you speak about it almost as if you are a rheumatologist. It's, in, it's insane how in depth <laughs> your knowledge is. Um, I'm too afraid to look at what else yeah. is coming because it just like, it's a condition of which you can deteriorate. And so- uh, I don't really want to know, but he seems to already be like ahead of it. So he knows what's coming. I think it makes him feel better to, to know what's coming. Whereas I'm not, yeah. up for, I'm not up for that as much. And so he, I do urge you to urge your partners to educate themselves because it, it changes so much when they understand that you're fatigue or your sometimes like lack of sex drive or your sometimes lack of life really? drive is not personal. It's nothing to do with them. They don't yeah. understand that you are pushing a fucking boulder up a hill yeah. from the second yeah. you open your eyes in the morning. And the reason this conversation is probably the most timely is because post pandemic, of course, a lot of people have had illness for the first time in their lives. They've had what, you know, long COVID has caused chronic illness in a lot yeah. of people, as you were saying. Some of them even have POTS, which is very yeah. random. Um, but, you know, we're, we're starting to have a more global understanding of chronic health conditions and how you can look okay on the outside but you feel like you're being dragged to the core of the earth while exactly. you're moving um yeah. which sounds dramatic but it's, it's really not <laughs> um but um and so uh i i'm hoping because a big part of why we need to destigmatize or like at least open up the conversation around invisible illness is that if we can I guess see it doesn't work so we're calling it invisible but at least if we can understand it we have more chances of more money and focus being put into treating yeah. it yeah and I think we're trying to make it visible I, I think that I think we do I, I think you know someone was asking me how I dealt with being so sick all that time and all the physical suffering and mm-hmm. I said you know the physical suffering was excruciating and incredibly challenging mm-hmm. um, but the thing that almost killed me Mm-hmm. was being invisible and having mm-hmm. all of that suffering go unseen and unrecognized and mm-hmm. therefore feel not meaningful right i think that mm-hmm. as humans we we want to feel our lives have some meaning in this crazy chaotic world that we live in right and it's we want that sense that i don't know someone sees us and therefore there's meaning to what we're experiencing um and when it's completely invisible it's hard to feel that there's any meaning to what we've gone through yeah it's it's incredibly tricky and then you add the layer of the chances of that going unseen are so much higher when you're a woman um also you had a statistic that was wild where you were saying something like 45 percent of people at the beginning of their journey with a, any kind of chronic um, health condition like a autoimmune disease, et cetera, or something like EDS um, are accused of hypochondria? Yes, so this is um, a statistic that's specific to autoimmune disease, which by the way, is something medicine does know exists. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. pretty, um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of women in particular have autoimmune diseases and they're very real and very debilitating and there's a wide number of them. And this was a figure that came from the Autoimmune Association and they found that in their first years of being sick, 45% of people searching for diagnoses um, were told they were hypochondriacs uh, before Fucking getting a crazy. really, I know, right? Before getting a really concrete diagnosis of a serious illness like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or um 
you know, autoimmune thyroiditis, all these different diseases that are incredibly debilitating and incredibly yeah. physically visible in the and body. They are Look. fucking hard to diagnose, uh, which yeah. is really tricky. There aren't always clear markers. Like there isn't a blood test for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is why it takes right. such a long time for most people to get diagnosed. Um, same thing with, with many of these things. Like you, we now have a test that shows if you have autoimmune markers, but it doesn't right. tell you exactly which autoimmune disease you yeah. have. So a lot yeah. of people have like Hashimoto's or all these kind of different things. There's yeah. no clear signal. Yeah. There can be for some of them, but you're yeah. totally right that, well, one problem is that there's this um, marker, they call it an ANA, it means anti-nucleic antibody. So interestingly, I had that positive from when I was 21, mm -hmm. but a lot of people who are healthy also have it positive. Mm -hmm. So my doctor was like- Why is that? Just because we all have antibodies in our bodies all the time and the immune system, which I didn't understand, I'm now totally fascinated in a really nerdy way by the yeah. immune system, but like the immune system is a highly personal, it changes all the time and it's kind of imprecise, right? It, it's responding and making anybody. So a lot of us make some antibodies to our own bodily tissues, mm -hmm. which we don't want to do because that means we're damaging our own tissues instead of say fighting, you know, um, Epstein-Barr virus or fighting a Lyme bacteria, but everyone's body is a little bit autoimmune. It seems at some point or another, yeah. it's just how autoimmune do you get and how much damage does it do? And how much over time is your body, your own immune system, your defense system attacking its own tissues. So I think another thing is that we have this kind of patriarchal medical system where again was not taking the testimonies of young women in particular very seriously and there i was as a 21 year old and they were looking at my cholesterol and being like that looks great but not giving credence to my testimony which might have led them to say huh she does have this positive ana maybe we should take that seriously so i think one thing we can do through advocacy and talking about this is make that part visible, right? That when people go to doctor's offices and say, I'm experiencing these symptoms, and then you have some markers of it, that needs to be taken much more seriously than I think it has been. And so, you know, this goes back hundreds of years and to, you know, like us being accused of hysteria and, and our emotions um, being used instead of pathology. And, you know, you bring up in the book that sometimes you think that comes from a place of doctors being afraid of not having the answers because they're supposed to be seen as the all seeing, all knowing, like members of our society, they're who we turn to when we don't have the answers, they're supposed to have them. And so rather than say, I actually don't know what this is because we haven't fucking studied women enough <laughs> in <laughs> biology, uh, they just go, I think it's stress. Yeah. Exactly. This, that, and the other, you know, like it, it's, it's actually, re it's remarkable. And I mean, I've gone through it, even though I have like one of the top rheumatologists on the planet, Professor Rodney Graham is like my, my, um, my doctor, he's, he's now retired because he's, uh, well, he's retiring because he's in his, I think, 90s. But, um, mm, wow. but, but I had such a respected doctor diagnose me and put me in the medical books. Like I'm in the medical journals from the age of nine Amazing. years old. There are pictures of me contorting and one and like them pulling like the skin from my elbow and from my oh, cheeks. Amazing. Yeah. Doctors from all over the world. Like, and even then in my twenties and thirties, I still have to explain what Ayla's fucking Dan loss is to people. And they still don't fully believe it. It's, yeah. in, it's insane. And this exists with so many, like, I think the only reason people know what lupus is is because the word was said every week on house, the TV show. <laughs> Like, it's like, totally true it, it like entered like the american vernacular normalized i know normalized. Normalized lupus. yes it's true yeah it's true. but we still don't know what it is or what it looks like or like how you're supposed or to get why. better and, yeah, yeah and then and then you're just given like opioids to deal with the pain a lot of times and they don't they treat the symptoms rather than even seek to understand the cause and opioids fuck you up in a different way like i have a liver that cannot handle a lot of painkillers like yeah. i also have a thing i don't know if you have this but um i don't know if this is eds but i process painkillers and anesthetic too fast they don't really work on me and i process them too fast um my friend That's scarlett curtis who was on this podcast does the same thing yeah. so like i've woken up in the middle of operations and and painkillers uh stop working on me incredibly quickly which is like yeah. a slippery yeah. slope to addiction because then it's you really need more tricky. and more and more. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I have to be very careful because yeah. I love painkillers. Um, <laughs> well, right. It's like, who doesn't not want to be in pain? Um, 
I have something very similar. Certain painkillers don't work at all on me or they work very, very, very briefly. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, one of the, you know, you were speaking before about how one of the problems is that we just haven't researched um, women's bodies. We don't yeah. know that much about them. Similarly, like if we haven't researched other Stanlos and these other kind of chronic illnesses that constellate, because a lot of them, as you're saying, do constellate around, if you have one, you might be more likely to also have others. Um, if you have an autoimmune illness, often a lot of people with autoimmune disease do have connective tissue issues and other stainless. Anyway, one of the problems is doctors are giving us opioids, but actually opioids don't really help with chronic pain of the kind that we have. Mm -hmm. They're not that effective for it. And there's a high risk of addiction. So we need a lot more research into pain um, management for chronic pain. And that's an area that's like deeply, deeply not and if you can't get research. diagnosed and if right. you can't get believed, how you don't you know how it? to live your life accordingly because it's a totally. lot of a lot of living with a chronic health condition is living your life preventatively, you know. And I, I want to get into that with you um in a minute. But there's something really important to discuss, right? So um and bear with me here because it's gonna sound controversial, but it's not going to end controversially. Uh with the growing conversation around trans people and trans rights, there's a lot of like uh, you hear a lot of stories of people no longer being allowed to refer to biology, right? Like we can, so the, the gender absolutely is a construct, but biology is real. And it's important in, in medicine specifically to acknowledge that biology is real. Otherwise, we will never progress in understanding how male and female bodies respond differently to certain medications, but also how diseases and autoimmune diseases can function differently, often like worse for some reason in female bodies. And also trans people can have a lot of uh, complications as to how treatment impacts them based on yeah, whichever absolutely. biology they have been born with. And so it isn't transphobic to uh, describe biology as a certainty. And it's really important to be allowed to say that because in the name of making sure that someone who's transitioning is getting the correct dosage of medication and the correct treatment, and, and that those people are having doctors look out for symptoms in the correct way, biology is real, but gender is 100% a construct. Well, I certainly think that we're not um, helping anybody by, we just haven't looked at deeply in science at how drugs are metabolized differently by different groups of bodies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we certainly are, have a legacy of misogyny and ignorance about, um, you know, female biology. We do um, a lot of studies on female animals, but not, I mean, on male animals, but not female. There's a lot we don't know, right? Ambien is processed really differently. Um, but we know even less, let's say, about someone who's assigned female at birth and is trans. Does Ambien make you racist? Is that what it does to women? <laughs> Ambien is that just why is there a bar? <laughs> oh yeah! Oh my god! I forgot about that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just, no, that's a good uh, one. It was a oh, low blow. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know but Ambien. Yes. Uh, wait, how does Ambien react differently in men? So basically, women don't, met um, you know, metabolize Ambien the same way and so we need half as much ambient and so they actually took ambient briefly off the market because women were maybe they didn't take it off the market but basically after ambient was released women were getting to car accidents the next day because they were Whoa. still on ambient and they did some retroactive research and realized that um, those people were metabolizing it totally differently and needed to have half the dosage so now if you by the way, never take, you know, your boyfriend's Ambien because the dosage is totally different, mm -hmm. um, right? And so anyway, so there's things like that where the way that drugs, um, the way aspirin is metabolized is different. But as I say in the book, like we know even less about autoimmune disease and trans bodies. We just, there's so much research that we need to do um, in a way that is not transphobic and is not essential. A hundred percent, The, the yeah. fluid really ways that we, you know, have biology and gender presentation yeah a hundred percent and i think i think we both come at that from the place of like the most wanting everyone to have yeah. uh the proper care that they yeah. require in order to live as healthily yeah. and as long and as happily as possible yeah and one thing i'll say is for my book and since my book i've talked to a lot of trans people living with autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. and if the issues of care i talked about you know um 
are present for lots of different groups, that is one of the groups that is getting the worst care possible. I think. If they're allowed care at all, yeah, you know, a growing lot of in bias the United and States, stigma. yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of yeah. Bias and stigma. Yeah, and it's yeah. and it's vital depending on you know which gender you are transitioning to that you are receiving the appropriate and proper care. It's um, it's really it's really extraordinary how long it's taken for us to acknowledge women's uh, suffering in healthcare, isn't it? It's amazing how much other women also even do. I've had female doctors gaslight me before, you know, like I've had PCOS yeah. and, and I've, I've, because I'm slim and I don't have hair on my chin right. uh, and I don't have acne, it, it took, yeah. takes a while. And it wasn't until I developed acne, I was like relieved when I got it. <laughs> and I was like, they might oh, fucking no. believe me now. I know. Uh, and then that led to actual, like I started like, gaining weight and I got acne and finally they were willing to start looking into it. So I'd had problems with my period for like a year and a half yep. before it's that kind of started amazing. to come on. Yeah. 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 Like it's as if we don't know our own bodies. Like we have such a high tolerance of pain that like, traditionally, obviously that could be different from person to person, but my yeah. good God, like we are so self-aware all the time. We have to be for our safety. I mean, one of the astonishing things that I found writing the book was how often, um, you know, in different groups are treated differently. As we were talking about, women get treated differently. People of color get treated differently. Women of color get treated really. Mm-hmm. Studies show the worst. You know, yeah, in terms I of, mean the 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 of, yeah. In terms of like being believed and being able to be like authorities about their own body in the way, or even given yeah. painkillers, yeah. like you or painkillers, no, like right. unbelievable amounts of stories of of black women being denied uh, painkillers yeah. even during childbirth, and the mortality rate for black women in the United States of yeah. America specifically is the worst in the world. Yeah. It's it's unbelievable and so disproportionate. Like it, it it's extraordinary how much white supremacy and patriarchy yeah. like still dominates yeah. the medical system and dominates what people are learning in school yeah we still don't and even I, understand fat bodies like i know after all these years well and there's often just it, it's really interesting that we hear so much about medical science and that often when there's any kind of critique or pushback to medical science it's presented as being anti-science but one of the things that i wanted to point out in my book is that you know i'm very very pro-science the problem mm-hmm. is that for many of the people i interviewed when they entered a doctor's office some fact of their body and their identity within a larger group meant that all too often instead of being asked what was wrong with them the medical system started saying why is something wrong with you in a in a in a in a reductive way where the why was equated with there's something wrong with you as a person as an individual as a psychology and that's what's really explaining your physical symptoms do you think now, that's specific to the united states i'm hearing about it in the uk i'm hearing oh. about it in canada i don't know enough to be honest about other parts of the world i i think it may be western in a lot of Mm -hmm. ways, right? Because I think in Western medicine, we want bodies to behave the same way. Um, Western medicine is kind of predicated on bodies should all behave the same way. And guess what? A lot of our bodies don't fit that norm. And I sometimes felt that I was in essence, almost being punished or kind of outcast as a person who couldn't really access healthcare because my body was not behaving the way it was supposed to behave Mm -hmm. according to medical textbooks. But what's really interesting about that is that, well, science itself should be interested in what don't we know? Like whose bodies live at the edge of medical knowledge and how do we push that knowledge toward their bodies as opposed to kind of rejecting their bodies and saying, you know, you're not, you don't fit a textbook. So therefore I don't believe you. And look, advances in mental health care are one of the most important things that happened in 20th century medicine. And this is not to say in any way that we don't also need to talk about the mental health piece, but what I saw in my recording that concerned me was that there was this reflexive desire to see all the physical symptoms that people were reporting as exclusively being triggered by a mental health issue. Whereas what I'm really looking for is a much more nuanced science that's looking at physical and mental health together. And looking at the fact, by the way, that many people with autoimmune disease also experience depression. Um, either but which one depression. causes which? Right, and, and there's yeah. sort of the depression of chronic illness. And then there's also like, what is inflammation which is rampant in your body and an autoimmune disease also doing to your brain. Like we just need a much more nuanced, sophisticated understanding 
of these questions and a better way of talking about them in a more integrated health well process. also like we're still like not god we're still somewhere between calling it anti-science and science when we talk about gut health and the impact <laughs> gut health has on your brain i mean you oh, there is there is a direct link between how your stomach is feeling and processing food and the way your brain feels and that's where a lot of brain fog comes in a lot of you know allergies yeah. and like a lot of you know it's the way that alcohol can i mean i don't know if this is linked to the gut necessarily but i'm i really want to understand why certain alcohols make certain people completely change alter their personality yeah. do you know what i mean like they'll be fine with a glass of white wine but a glass of red wine will make them want to fight you like what is totally. that there's got to be yeah. some link to way to the way yeah. that it's processed in the stomach and then the brain. Like it's just, it's inc it's incredibly unusual. And and might I say, because you know I believe, you know from reading your work that you are open to both um, allopathic and naturopathic paths of recovery. Right, allopathic being like mainstream um, medicine. I as a as a South Asian, and I I don't think I've ever really said this before, but like. I, I believe in a combo of both. I'm incredibly pro-science. Um, fucking yeah. wanted to be a doctor when I was younger. <laughs> I was super South Asian and I am the, you know, <laughs> I am the stereotype. Like, I fucking love science. I love biology. Yeah. I think we've made extraordinary strides and yeah. we're saving people's lives all over the world. But I also think this complete shutdown of all naturopathic approaches of thinking food has any link to health, uh, of thinking that the gut uh can be linked to you know your general autoimmune like i find it a bit fucking racist if i'm honest just because <laughs> because yes, like yeah. because like in eastern and yeah. and southeastern and south asian like um cultures we do believe that food isn't all medicine of course like i'm not advocating for going on a celery juice fast if you've got cancer of course not but we believe in an, in, an intuitive and, mm -hmm. and whole life approach mm -hmm. towards well-being. Yeah. And you look yeah. at Asians and a lot of us fucking live a really long, like a much longer time than most Westerners without yeah. a thousand pills in our cabinet, right? Yeah. There, there is something to the way that we treat con health conditions and our more holistic approach. And, and ashwagandha isn't just some white woman like right. West Hollywood, cafe right. gratitude, like bullshit. Right. Like right. Those, that's from my people. That's like a powerful, long it's studied a herb. Yeah. Powerful, yeah. long studied herb, like a Chinese yeah. medicine, fucking yeah. extraordinary. Yeah. Look at, look okay. at how well they are. For I fuck's know. sake, they look <laughs> fantastic. Like they're, they're feeling Maybe. good. <laughs> but like i but i find it like i don't feel like we're allowed to have this conversation yet especially like the pandemic became so mm -hmm. like binary and like you are I either know. pro science or against science there's not allowed to be any nuance and it's like and it's now made doctors feel the most emboldened i've ever even doctors i've had on this podcast even podcasts like doctors that i respect mm. are so demonizing of anything that that yeah that's yeah. uh, like steps outside of the norm yeah that look i mean, coming yeah. mad and it comes from a place of like oh, what west is best do you think you know you have all the answers look how many medicines your people are on you know i think that's such an important point by the way about right the the western centric possibly mm -hmm. you know race is part of that but and i a thousand percent agree with you i mean to me the idea that somehow the whole body and the whole life is not part of our health just seems mm -hmm. on the face of it preposterous like and when you actually again look at science science tells us that the immune system and the nervous system are totally connected and it's just the future of science is going to look so different and it's going to come back to this whole body approach and i think western medicine is going to realize how much it has to learn from um eastern and whole body approaches yeah there's just yeah. less money to be made yeah. from telling yeah. people to go for a walk uh, every day and telling right. them to like it Eat takes more time foods. and it yeah. takes more time, right? It takes time to build a relationship with someone where you, and also people in the Western tradition are just not trained to think about, again, like my body might need certain kind of foods that another person's body might not. Like we are all different. We have different processing habits. We need different things to nourish us and to help us be strong. And for example, um, I was vegetarian for a really long time and it just didn't work for me it's ethically what I would like to be but mm -hmm. I have just realized like my blood work and everything looks way better when I'm yeah eating I'm the same some meat and that's just a body type and it was eastern medicine that taught me that it was the first time people were saying to me look based on your body and what you're presenting as here's what you need and 
Chinese medicine got me almost totally better when I still didn't even have a diagnosis. Yeah. By the way. It was yeah. so powerful. Well, yeah. it was nat naturopathic medicine that made yeah. me realize about like yeah. my gut microbiome totally. and the fact that actually, and, and, and my, my, my allopathic doctors, they were like, no, 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 we don't really acknowledge that candida or whatever the fuck you want to right. call it, like in right. the gut is real right. and this, that, and the other, like they yeah. think it can only present in the vagina for some reason and nowhere yeah. else. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I started working on like the, what, what I was eating and, and yeah. hot foods and, and the right foods and nothing that's super, super inflammatory, like for my personal health, I got much better. And yeah. when I don't do it, I get much worse. And there's a direct uh, correlation. Um, but again, I think it's, it's, it's financially, <laughs> it's hugely financially motivated. I think it is the, and like, this isn't me about to go all Gwyneth. You know what I mean? Like, mm. I, like I, I, not to use that as like some sort of a slur, but like, I, I'm still, like I said, my doctors are, I'd say 70% mainstream science and 30% naturopathic and, and, and sort of re into regenerative, right? They are into preventative, whereas my allopathic doctors are more reactive. Yeah. And I, I just think right. if you are someone who is desperate for answers, be careful when you are going towards a naturopathic doctor who tells you I'm gonna take away all of your problems because they also operate on a business model uh, which totally. you have talked about in your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but don't don't allow people to demonize you out of searching for answers that more mainstream medicine just might not have yet. And you use the word intuitive, which I think is a really important word too. And it's hard because we can sort of have intuitions that turn out to be wrong. Yeah, um, and we can tell anxiety. ourselves yeah. right, and we can and we can. I told myself the wrong story about my illness for a long time, but I think as you live with illness and get more and more honest with yourself and sort of keep really good journals or whatever it is that helps you see your symptoms. I've started to develop a pretty intuitive sense of like, you know what? I think that food is not helping me. It, it's not showing yeah. up in any way in my lab work that it's bad, but like, I can just feel, I feel bad after I eat it or whatever it might be. Yeah. Can I ask why it is that 80% of people with autoimmune disease turn out to be women? Yeah. It's a great Especially question. given that women are so much harder to diagnose as an, it's harder for women to get diagnosed. Yeah. So I know it's that? like a, they, you know, you won't be surprised to learn. They don't really know. <laughs> I haven't done enough research. <laughs> Everyone's like, it's a great mystery. I'm like, is it a mystery or have you just not put money <laughs> into researching it? Is but it because a... we're just so emotional? Okay. Yeah, exactly. We've, we're, we're hysterical. You know, hysterical yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> look, it seems to be a couple things. Um, we have, um, you know, people, I, I want to be mindful of trans people too, but um, if you have two X chromosomes, mm -hmm. you are um, more likely to have a mutation in both, right? If, if the mutation is on the X chromosome, you don't have a balancing Y, right? Mm -hmm. So certain kinds of mutations show up more in people with two X chromosomes. Um, and then uh, hormones seem to be a big part of it too, that just different patterns of estrogen in our lives seem to be thresholds for the you know um start of an autoimmune disease so something about estrogen and the immune system that isn't well understood is another another piece there those are those are two of the things that doctors were talking to me about yeah it's also like the fact that our hormones are more sensitive to in my opinion um as someone who didn't go to school uh but who has lived in this body for a long time and spoken to lots of people who did go to very good schools um that uh, the, the hormones that we put in chicken, the, yeah, the, exactly. that we pump full of, like, in fact, a lot of our meats and a lot of our milks and our cheeses, exactly. again, another reason why I wish I could be vegan, but it just doesn't work for me every time I try. Um, uh, a lot of our shit, there's pesticides that are yes. on the plants. And again, it kind of, you kind of go like, oh God, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but we are in the West where we also have lobbyists for, you know, the food industry and totally. big sugar who yeah. if yeah. we were to admit that we need a more kind of like intuitive and, and, you know, whole food approach to our health, then that would destabilize not only big pharma, but it would also destabilize the food industry, two of the reigning industries of the United States of America who control our politics and everything else. Um, so we are predisposed to having our hormones fucked with. All that stuff starts to mess with your 
general biome, it all starts to mess with your system. It starts to, you know, we're seeing like a, an, an epidemic, not only of autoimmune diseases, but we're also seeing an epidemic of people being antibiotic resistant. Yeah. And some of these people aren't people like me who've taken a fucking million antibiotics. <laughs> yeah. They're people who are just getting it because they're drinking yeah. the water or eating the, like, do you know what I mean? Eating the food. And so that's another massive thing is like, please, please investigate what it is that you are eating to either deal with your chronic health issue, not as in cure it. I don't think you can cure them, but I think you can reduce symptoms. And also as a preventative, please look into what you're eating, what the food source is, where you're getting it. Organic food is unbelievably expensive, but there are ways to access food that has been less fucked with. Try to avoid food with chemicals in the name if you can afford it. Like just, it, it's so vital that we have this conversation that there is a link between yeah. our environmental factors and the way that we feel. Yeah, and, I mean, and it's a great place to at least start taking some control of your life, I've found. I I think the discussion about food is such an important one. And it is one we need to have as a society, because as you say, not everyone has access to these. And I see that as an equity, like a health equity, yeah. issue, right? It's like the we, wealth gap equals a health right? gap. We, yeah. we need to make it um, access to healthy food and equitable reality. And, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book is that we really are living through what researchers call to me. It's not a conspiracy in any way to say an epidemic of these illnesses and they're on the rise um, in particular autoimmune disease. And all the researchers I talk to, the scientists say something about our environment and our food system that is causing the rise of them is clearly. And there's really good work done by the journalist Donna Jackson Nakazawa, I believe her name is, where she talks about the fact that we know about carcinogens, right? We know that there are certain chemicals that cause cancer, but we've done almost nothing to investigate what she calls autogens or autogenic chemicals. So that is chemicals that trigger autoimmune disease. There's been a little bit of work done. It's very hard to study. No one wants to fund those studies, right? But some Weird. studies that, right, <laughs> strangely, but some of the studies that were done showed, hey, this chemical that's used in dry cleaning is autogenic. Like it triggers autoimmune disease in animals. So we have to imagine where it would be reasonable to think there's a lot out there, you know, in the food we're eating, in the you know, dry cleaning we do, in the chemical processing of various plants and productions you know, that's messing with our bodies. And this just, it would be naive to think the government is really concerned about that at this point in time. <laughs> you know, we, we just don't have a system. So here we are, we're talking about how fucked everything is. I hate leaving everything on that note. And yes. I feel like you and I have been able to regain not all, but some semblance of control and understanding over our bodies. And well done for that because it's really hard as a woman. Um, but uh, where do you th feel like we go here? Like, what do you want your book to teach people other than that they're not alone? Uh, where would you like this movement to steer towards? Yeah, that's such a great question. I mean, the first part really is the not being alone, right? That I do want people to realize that there's millions of us and that we're, we're we don't have to go unseen and unheard. And I think the second part is coming together to raise, raise our voices, to have these conversations. And it can sound hokey, but the idea of the title, The Invisible Kingdom, was that, you know, when, you, when you're alone dealing with your illness and being gaslit, you feel quite powerless. But when we come together, we really, there are so many of us, and it really is this kind of kingdom and in that is visibility i think so i think we need to talk about um changes in the environment we need to talk about the reality of these conditions and the fact that they're quite real quite debilitating that we need more research more funding and we need frameworks for understanding them so it's not left to each individual to make the case for the reality of their own condition right we, mm -hmm. we have these conditions we're doing our best. We talked about, you know, it's like everyone living with these conditions really are kind of warriors of the day to day. Um, and I think have a hunger for life, right? That's why we're suffering is because we mm -hmm. have a hunger for life. And so I think we just, we have to make it known that these conditions are real, they're common, they manifest in these ways. It's not fussiness, it's not, you know, you're being difficult or my being difficult. It's just, we have to think about our environment. And in fact, we may be the canaries in the coal mine in a way. So it's actually incumbent on all of us to start thinking about 
our food systems, our chemicals, the environment, and how they're going to affect our bodies. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I also would love to uh, just briefly, because I know I've had you for a long time now, but I would love to also just touch on like a realization that we talked about over the phone that, you know, I've been having, and I, I think you can relate to, which is that, you know, I came into this industry when I was kind of, you know, unexpectedly given this opportunity. And then I was like, I'm going to be a role model for people <laughs> with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome who feel like they can't achieve their dreams. I'm going to achieve all my fucking dreams and more <laughs> so I can show those little kids they can do it. And that's a lovely sentiment from me. Lovely. What a lovely intention. Fucking dangerous and stupid yeah. in the end. Well, right? I've done, I, like, I, not to say that you can't do anything, but <laughs> Jesus Christ, have I been humbled by my health in realizing that actually a lot of the things that we've been taught to go for, the things that we as sick people look at normal people doing as the goal are just not sustainable for our bodies. And I have had a huge real reevaluation in my life uh, in the last like few years where I've just gone like, so I think a lot of people did during the pandemic. A lot yeah. of people tapped out of the hustle culture and fucked off out the rat race and moved to the countryside somewhere cheaper and have had a nicer life and feel better for it. But as a chronically ill person, there's almost like an extra layer some of us have of pride that like, no, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna fucking show everyone I can do it. Like I'm not gonna have something taken away. And when you do that, you can't help but inadvertently look at your body as kind of the enemy as the thing that's setting you back and you're trying to kind of trick your body out of it or like mm -hmm. i'll go do this huge tour really quickly and then i'll give myself a week you know mm -hmm. to recover from it it's like you're, you're pushing yourself too hard mm -hmm. and yeah. i have reevaluated what those big goals of mine are i've been talking about it a lot on my instagram that like i'm just not going to be able to do what my peers can do and you know what that's okay because I want to achieve some of my dreams, but I also want to feel good while I'm doing them. The amount of times I've done something that has like literally made history or like broken a record or done something that's like great representation of my people, sometimes it has resulted in an immense illness in which I couldn't then enjoy myself afterwards. Yeah. And fuck it's... that. So right. fuck the rat race. Fuck <laughs> hustle culture. I'm never going to be one of those full time, um, you know, public figures. I'm going to take 50% of my life to spend in my bed or on my couch with my friends. I'm going to live in warm places. I'm going to prioritize eating well rather than saving up loads of money so I can have loads of money. Like I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want that expensive bag. I want yeah. that healthy, unfucked with food, you yeah. know, like I'm just, yeah. I'm done with everything that women specifically are told to do. I don't want to try and achieve the unachievable anymore. Yeah. I'd like to you know, just find a like find a happy balance and know that it's okay. You're not quitting if you choose to like tap out of the absolute top of the mountain. Going halfway up is fucking amazing, and that's and I'll meet you there. You know what? I needed to hear that today. I this is it's I so agree with everything you're saying, and it's amazing though how there are these moments where we get pulled back in, right? Mm -hmm. and yeah, everything about my life is structured around my illness. And that's part of why I can do all the things I do. And, um, and then that tricks me into thinking I can do more than I can. So I just got mm -hmm. back from my paperback book tour, which was incredible. And it was such an honor and mm -hmm. incredible experience for me to go meet other people and talk to people like you. I mean, it, I feel so much less alone while doing it. But I was traveling a lot. And this week has been really, really hard and physically and then mentally. And um, I think it, I've been also struggling with the mental piece of recognizing that like, oh, right, it did take a toll on me and I'm not invisible <laughs> and I, my hacks get me so far, but they don't cure me, mm -hmm. right? And there are moments where I'm like, I just want to fantasize that I can be that self who can do all the things and be part of the rat race. But what this has taught me over and over and humbles me into realizing over and over is that, right, I'm just a person in a body that is a little bit broken in certain ways. And um, I I have to learn to live within that. And it, I'll tell you, it's hard. Like sometimes painful. I'm like, it's yes, painful acceptance. absolutely. Yeah. Well, cause also it's like, I think one thing chronic illness does give us, and I don't know if you felt this, but in the pandemic, I felt like weirdly prepared for lockdowns because I was mm -hmm. like, 
this too will pass. This is really hard, but we all have to make adjustments to our lives at times, right? I'd already had to do that. So lockdown yeah. didn't feel like a No, it felt not, it honestly, it felt like a right. holiday. Yeah. It felt kind of normal in a way. I was like, yeah. right, this is sort of what we all need to do. So I look at friends of mine and I think, right, this rat race is going to catch up with you eventually. And I have the perspective to be able to say, like, slow down. But then I get caught up in it too. Um, because it, it's fun. There's it's fun, fun to be had. There's fun to it's be fun had. To be I had. went out on Oscars night. Uh, yeah. until like five in the morning and then yeah. I was fucked for three days yeah. and there are exactly. times where you go that was worth right. it that was, that worth, was it. worth it but it's right. just about picking what is worth it. it it sounds to me like fundamentally that book tour as fucked as you are was mm-hmm. worth it but maybe there are alterations you make next yeah. time exactly. maybe you maybe you have more dates in between you know which is harder when you have kids yeah. um but you know yeah. you maybe you take a little bit more time and space that shit out and and one of the greatest, I think, gifts of me getting old and just not giving as much of a fuck is that I started to tell the people I work with that I do have limitations. It doesn't mean I'm less skilled. Thank God for the one aspect of the pandemic, which meant that we were allowed to work from home because I've been sick for, like, really sick for, like, the last one, two, three, six, six and a half months. I have been barely in and out of my bed. And thank Sorry. God I've been able to do this podcast and my other podcast from my bedroom. Like my bed right. is right behind me um, yeah. because I, my career would be over and I would lose my home, wow. you know? So God, God yeah. bless the fact that we're allowed to work from home now. May that always remain an option for many of us. Um, but also just learning that I'm not weak. I'm actually incredibly strong. And it also takes incredible strength to know your, limitations not other people's limitations for you when doctors my yeah. doctor told me i would never do anything i'd never achieve anything and i'd be in a wheelchair by the age of 21 and dead by the time i'm 50 because they didn't know there was a difference back then before between like vascular, vascular. Yeah. uh which is you know really shortened your lifespan and um hgds which i have uh so uh, th- there's tremendous strength in that self-reflection and and i really thank you for your book thank really you. thank you and like now when people say what do I do? What do I send my doctor or my loved ones so they'll understand me or my parents? I'm going to send them your book oh, because, you. and, I, and I hope everyone does because you've created an extraordinary Bible of, of information and relatability that is going to be, so, it must already be so, like it is already like, it's already so acknowledged and, and beloved in the short time in which it's been out, but it's such a vital piece of work and um, it's going to change a lot of people's lives. And so thank you for that. Thank you. That's incredibly meaningful to hear. Thank you. Thank There's you. been such a fun, I could chat to you for 45 hours. Oh, I know. Hours. We could do a whole series. <laughs> honestly, I mean, I feel, this is the beginning of something, Megan. Like, yeah. it's, the, it's the beginning no, of something. Um, I really appreciate I feel, you. And Go on, sorry. I was going to say, I, you know, I, it, it is funny. How, it makes you me realize how alone one is in one's illness to talk to another person who gets yeah. it so that there's an immediate shorthand so I feel very seen <laughs> oh good I'm glad I'm really glad it's, and it's true um and may we all continue to push for biology to yes, to science. to exist outside of what is just profitable in the west yes, yes you know exactly science um, it's more than profit that's actual wisdom yeah 100 percent. thank you please come again come again 1000 times onto this podcast you're welcome anytime thanks for having me